All right, hi guys, welcome to the webinar. This is Online Finishing with Boris Continuum 10. Our guest presenter is Dan Harvey. He's a tutor at the National Film and Television School, and he's a post-production industry veteran. Join our community. We are on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and Vimeo. So a little bit about Dan. Dan is based in the UK. And he's a veteran with years of teaching and post-production expertise. Dan's worked as a professional colorist and also as a product specialist and manager for Autodesk, The Pixel Farm, and Quantel. Dan is currently a visiting tutor at the National Film and Television School. And Peter and I are here to answer any Boris Effects questions you have via the text chat. Dan, I'm going to pass this over to you. Hi, everybody. Dan Harvey here for Boris Effects. Um, I'm going to be starting with uh, an example of uh, skin smoothing techniques. And... Um, I'll begin just by showing you the base clip here. So um, we're going to do a little bit of work on on the uh, the, uh, the skin texture here. Um, I've got a couple of layers in my composition. I've, I've put the original down at the bottom so we can quickly compare the results just by switching down to that layer. But I'm going to be working primarily in this layer. So without further ado, I'll go into the image restoration group and select the BCC Beauty Studio tool drag that down into my video track and that's now applied with its default settings. I'll just bypass that to show you before and after. So before I get it, it deep into um, the uh, the actual explaining the actual parameters of the tool, I want to isolate it so that we don't uh, pick up the background and, uh, and the hands and stuff like that. It's just the, really the, the skin tone on the face that I want to work with. So to do that, I'll uh, engage the Pixel Chooser. And the Pixel Chooser is an advanced selection tool that allows us to create um, selections based on keys, masks, and also the integrated Mocha roto splining tool with integrated planar tracking. So I'll go ahead and open the Pixel Chooser first. That open the map, the map group. As you will see, the default color selection for the Pixel Chooser mat happens to be a typical European European flesh tone, so there's not, not a, a great deal of tweaking to do here. I'll just go and sample the highlights and shadows. And we're currently looking at the, the Pixel Chooser output. If I go and look at chosen pixels here and look at the mat, you can see the result. And uh, that's the basic mat. I'm going to tweak the uh, the softness to get the, the required result. Softness, as you will probably know, will increase the amount of grayscale component in the mat. So as I increase the hue softness or decrease it, I'm changing the amount of contrast based on that selection. So I'm just going to bring the softness down in the saturation so that I'm not including the less saturated colors in the key and just get that more or less where I want it. Now I don't want to affect the eyes and uh, and the uh, the teeth and the lips and so on so I'm gonna I'm gonna mask those out in Mocha. So Mocha as I say is integrated into the pixel chooser so if I just go ahead and launch Mocha um, before I do I've just got a little warning here saying um, my host is not set to full resolution. What that means is that Avid Media Composer, you can see down here the video quality setting is currently set to a proxy mode. Um, and I'm going to leave it like that because um, I don't need that that, uh, that level of detail because Mocha is going to give me a pretty good track uh, even working at proxy resolution here. This, but for your information, this footage is uh, HD native footage, but I'm viewing it in proxy mode here in Avid. So I'm going to Go ahead and continue, and now I'm presented with the Mocha UI. Um, <clears throat> so that whatever, I, whatever I do in here when I hit the Save button, that will be saved as a mask within the Pixel Chooser for the currently selected effect. So I'm going to go to the end of the, the, um, the clip because this is where the detail that I want to track is biggest in frame and uh, it's always good to start with more detail and work back from there uh, because we'll get a better lock. So now I'm going to go and use the create bezier tool and trace around the shape as required and 
there we've got a, a rough shape around that and now I'm ready to begin tracking so with my shape selected the gear icon up here indicates that that's enabled for tracking so when I hit the track button to track backwards now it begins tracking. I can stop the track at any time because we've got keyframeable roto splines kind of overlaying the, uh, the planar tracker. So what I'll do here because the thumb was occluding the detail that I wanted to track, I can just go in here and add a keyframe. Now you can see that we've got a keyframe on the, on the shape and that's now rotoed with keyframes to fit the right area at that point. Now we can track backwards from here and now we've got our basic shape. Once again, I'll go to the end. As I mentioned before, I'm just going to turn off the, uh, the zoom view on the points there. Um, as I said before, we want to protect the eyes and the mouth here. So I've got a track on the basic shape. So I can go in here and say, add additional points as required and trace around there and do the same for the other eye. and also for the mouth and I'll just trace around there and close that shape so these are now cutting a hole in that area if I go up here and display the mat I'll turn the mat on you can see that's an overlay I can change the transparency of the mat overlay here to see more or less of it we can see that the the additional shapes have cut a hole in the other one and they're inheriting the track information from the master shape up the top here so that's my basic uh, holdout map for the key I can go ahead and save that and that's saved within the composition I also plan to use this this shape upstream in the composition so if I go into the menu here and say export project then I can put that on my desktop or in any folder of my choosing to reload further down the line so I'll save and I'll exit the Mocha UI and now that tracking mask is applied to as a garbage mask effectively for my uh, for my key I can go into the the mask properties here and adjust the feathering of the mask so I apply an overall softening to the edges just to smooth that a little bit and now when I switch back to view the result now we can see that the the area outside of the mask is being protected from the effect of toggle bypass off and on and this is uh, applied with a kind of optimal preset for uh, a typical a typical flesh tone but I'm going to get in there and, and tweak it a little bit more so in the smoothing group here this is where the the, uh, the detail parameters for this this tool can be found um, the detail levels uh, you can set up to five detail levels depending on how much we want to finesse this uh, ranging from the smallest I'll just zoom in here so we can see I'll just dial them all back to zero and just select the um, the slider and enter zero there to reset them so there's the the original if I say smooth the smallest details you'll see that I'm affecting the pores only in the skin the very finest high frequency details on the image so if I go in here and, and smooth the, the pores and then small is for the slightly bigger details such as these fine laugh lines around the eyes and, and mouth and then the large details will affect bigger wrinkles and uh, sort of more broad um, more broad uh, folds of skin or whatever so if we go in there and tweak that you can see how we're really smoothing it out I'm, I'm overcooking it a little bit because I'm, I'm uh, mindful that we might not be seeing the full detail on the because of the compression that's applied in the streaming but uh, if I bypass that off and on you can see now that very smooth uh, flesh tone but 
because of the key, we've, we kept the detail in the, the highlights in the teeth and the mouth and, and so on. So another useful parameter is preserve contrast. And what this does is keeps the underlying contrast light and shade on the image so we don't lose the, the lighting and the shading. Mix with original, as with most of the, the, uh, the BCC effects, just allows us to blend it back um, with the original to make that look a little bit more subtle. So once again, show before and after, and we've got a much smoother uh, flesh tone within that area. In addition, I could apply some color correction here. If I go and turn the color correction tool on and twirl open the color correction group, we've got basic color correction tools by going here and adjust the saturation. You notice that I'm affecting the whole image at the moment. That's because the use mask option isn't on. So if I go in here and say use mask, now we've kind of given her a bit of a, a suntan into the bargain. Um, obviously that's a little bit extreme, but I'm going to dial that back. And also just reducing the contrast a little bit, that can help uh, with the smoothing overall. So if we just bypass that off and on, you can see the result of what we've done. At this point, we could consider uh, that the, 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 uh, the job has been completed, but something that really a, a trained eye will, will notice is especially if there's noise on the background or, uh, or grain on the background or in the areas that are unaffected, then you'll have, uh, particularly in low light situations, then you'll have noise moving around um, and dithering but in the area that's been corrected, it's, it's super smooth, and that really, you know, that really gives the game away. Um, so my plan is to uh, is to introduce a little bit of noise back into this area, so that we've got a, a, a smooth pattern of noise across the whole image, and also the noise perceptually uh, will will help um, help integrate the um, the effect into the composition as well. So. I want to use that key that I um, that I pulled on the uh, on the face. If I go into the, um, the pixel chooser here and say open up the presets list, I want to save a preset. I'm going to stick it on my desktop, and now that's ready for me to pick up uh, and use in another in another effect upstream. So I'm going to back up to the start of the shot, and I'm going to use the keyboard shortcut, shortcut Control and Y, um, or we can do that from the uh, user interface by right-clicking here to add a new video track. Um, now, what I'm going to do here is basically apply the the match grain filter to the next layer, um, and the uh, the easiest way I find to do that is just to select the layer and apply the effects to the filler. Um, so I'm going to go into the film style group and I'm going to find the film grain tool and I'm going to drag that into the composition. Okay, now the film grain tool is applied overall. Um, now that's applied to that layer, I'm going to go ahead and load the, um, load the selections to hold it back. Uh, again, you might not see the the film grain effect applied um, with the uh, because of the streaming compression that's applied here. So what I'm going to do, is I'm just going to remove that layer, and I'm going to apply it on the on the layer below, um, and and turn it up a little bit stronger. So to add an additional effect to a composition without replacing the one that's already there, if you Alt drag on Windows or Command, uh, sorry. Option drag on OS X. Now you can add the effect above it without affecting um, what's below it. So now we've got a, basically a stack of effects up here. We've got the film grain, and down below we've got the Beauty Studio effect. So if I remove the film grain effect and add the match grain effect, which is a little bit stronger, I'm just mindful that you're not seeing the, the full effect because of the streaming compression that should be a little bit more aggressive now you'll see the the result again the resolution that you're working at is um, critical uh, 
particularly when when you're working with grain and and the error message is sort of just an information message is saying switch the full resolution to sample grain because we need to be at the full resolution in order to see the grain properly I've actually placed a little patch of grain up here at the sample because uh, you probably won't be able to see the full detail uh, when we're streaming but hopefully now you should see before and after the match grain effect is applied and at the moment the match grain is applied globally across the image I want to hold that back with the pixel chooser so if I go and turn the pixel chooser on and then go and load the pixel chooser mat from the desktop so this is the one that I saved a minute ago and if we look at the chosen pixels now we can see I've got the same key that I saved for reuse earlier on so that saved me a little bit of time setting that up it means that we've got a consistent mat as well between both layers so if I jump into mocha this time and repeat that for the mocha shape um, I can I could do the same thing so if we go to the, uh, the mocha shape by launching mocha and go to the mocha menu here and say merge project now we can see what I saved to the desktop I'll open that up and now we've got the tracking mask as before I'll save that into this layer and exit from mocha and add a little bit of feathering and now if we look at the chosen pixels we can see I've now got the same mask for the the match grain layer as I have for the other one so now if I want to sample the grain I can pick up the I'll just turn the, the mask on and you see before and after in this flat shaded area so I want to pick up the the uh, the grain that I've put up here so this is where I can select from any part of the screen so if I say pick up the sample center from the on-screen widget if I park that here that's going to pick up the the very subtle grain which is actually on the original clip which I don't think you're going to see with the streaming compression if I park this on the the little patch that I've created now you should see quite clearly how the, the sampled grain is applied within the region protected by the, the mocha mask and pixel chooser that I set up earlier obviously that's a little bit extreme but this is uh, this is intended to as a technical illustration of the workflow rather than uh, the aesthetics once we have a sample we can adjust the grain size as required and if we disable lock sample as we go through the clip so the the effect will update and the, the seed the noise seed will change randomly on every frame so effectively the noise will sort of come to life and uh, and dither if we put lock sample on then you just have a, a single uh, sample of noise a symbol uh, the, the same seed will be applied on every frame and that won't, that, that won't sort of come to life so I'm going to leave lock sample off here and as in the previous example I'm now going to dial that back a little bit in terms of its intensity I'll switch back to proxy res I'm only just working on a little MacBook Pro here so I'll work at proxy res just to get a little bit more interactive so now as I scroll through you can see that updating I'm now going to mix that back just so that that's a little bit more subtle and if we go back down to the original here and show the result we can see now that we've achieved the smoothing but because we've got the um, the grain sitting on top not only is the, the grain consistent with the, the flat shaded areas around the area that we're working with also the effect of that dithering percept perceptually um, enables it to sit in a little bit more transparently into the composite so this is 
a good step to apply if you have the time to, to really put a finishing touch to these, um, these skin smoothing effects just to make them a little bit more transparent. So that wraps up the, um, the, uh, the section on uh, Beauty Studio, BCC Beauty Studio, part of the, uh, the image restoration unit in BCC 10. And we're going to move on and take a look at uh, advanced color correction techniques. So um, my observation is uh, in the conform uh, and online, grading is, is becoming an increasing part of the online process. In the, uh, in the good old days, the editor's job was finished when, uh, when the, the, uh, the offline had been checked against the, the conform and uh, all the cuts were in the right place. Um, the edit editor could uh, breathe a sigh of relief and pass the job on to the colorist for the final grade. But uh, nowadays, online and grade are increasingly part of the same process. So um, we're going to look at a, a range of strategies in, uh, in BCC to support editors uh, who are being called on to do color correction, both uh, quick preset base effects and more finessed effects. So this is our, my base plate here. Um, I'm going to begin with looking at some uh, some preset tools. So if we go into the, the color and uh, into the film style group here, there are a couple of uh, a couple of tools here that have uh, recently been optimized for the GPU uh, Open G Open CL. Uh, GPU accelerated tools. So if I hit play, you can see that's pretty interactive, even on my little MacBook Pro here. That's the BCC Fast Film Glow tool. Um, just for your information, I'm going to be switching between different workspaces here, and to save going up to the uh, the menu bar to do that, I've mapped my different workspaces to hotkeys. So F1 is going to take me to Source Record Editing, F2 into Avid's native color correction mode, F3 is into effects mode. So as you see those changing, uh, that's me hitting hotkeys rather than uh, selecting those from the workspaces up here. So I'm in the effects editing mode at the moment, and now I can see when the effect editor panel is enabled, I can see the parameters for the BCC fast film glow effect, which again, when we apply it, it's applied with its basic preset parameters. And what the Film Glow tool does is applies uh, a, a boost to the highlights and optionally a blur and desaturation within the highlight selection. So at the moment I'm viewing the output of the effect. If I want to see the effect kind of in isolation, if I go view glow, then the glow effect is, is comped over black and I can see what I'm affecting here. So if I back off the glow radius a little bit, now you can see the uh, the basic glow effect without any blurring or softening applied to it. We can go in here and either sample or set the glow color. Um, and then when we add radius parameter, then that's blurred outwards. To, basically, the, the goal here is to simulate lens blooming on a on uh, a traditional film camera and by biasing the, the effect to the X or Y axis then we can we can get different looks in that way. So I'm just going to make those uniform and just give that a little bit of a uh, little bit of glow blur and the desaturation parameter, we can desaturate where the, the, uh, the glow is working or we can force the saturation where the glow is working. The threshold, as with most of the, the BCC tools, the threshold sets the luminance level at which the effect becomes active. So if I go set the threshold high, then only the, the brightest input colors will be uh, triggering the effect. If I bring it back down, then it cuts in at lower luminance levels. So once again, I'm going to go switch back to output and just tweak the, the parameters as required. And under the extras tab here, this is quite useful. 
we've got the, the mixer with the original tool so we can dial it back and then we've got a range of apply modes which are really powerful um, for creating different looks so if I can apply it in screen mode for example or in multiply and if you know your maths how these different apply modes work they can get a combination of subtle uh, variations on the preset look but as I said before um, we're looking primarily at preset based workflows at, at this stage um, and that's of great use to editors and designers that are under time pressure uh, you haven't got if you haven't really got time to finesse something then uh, we can quickly jump into the effects browser and pick something which gives us a good starting point and we can either work with that or we can tweak it to our custom requirements so if I go to the effects browser and hit apply now I've loaded the required preset I can go into my my extras tab dial it back a little bit change its apply mode whatever until I've got the required effect I'm going really sort of a, like a kind of old Technicolor kind of look here. So once I've applied that, you see before and after, uh, I can save that as my own preset now. So if I go into the preset group and hit save, I've now saved my own customized version of uh, the factory presets for, for use on other shots. So that's Fast Film Glow. I'm just going to remove that. And another film, film emulation tool which has also been optimized for uh, the GPU in BCC10 is the Fast Film Process tool. That gives us a little bit more parameters to work with. Once again, I'm going to jump into the Effects Browser, um, select uh, one of the presets that I created earlier, so one of my presets, I'll apply that and I can go in there and just take a quick look at the the, uh, the parameters so in the in the fast film process tool you've got a, a little color correction a little basic color corrector that you can pre-process your shot before feeding it into the, the filters such as lens misting um, and we can put a misting into the shadows or the highlights likewise you've got threshold controls for where the highlights become active and so I'll turn up the highlight misting there and then bring the highlight threshold down so that cuts in at a, a lower level of luminance likewise the shadows I can make those cut in earlier and spread the shadows out so we get a kind of like an aged film effect that's faded um, if we look at the presets here we can see there's some um, a lot of useful presets for basically simulating um, vintage film looks sort of um, color processes like cost cross processing and, and bleach bypass and uh, optical things like lens misting and so on so a very quick and easy way to get either a look to, to work with or a look to develop um, and customize um, <clears throat> in addition we've got uh, another thing that editors that are tight for time will be very pleased to see is the the BCC vignette tool um, this gives us uh, a very quick way of generating vignette looks and there's as before a library of pr different types of presets here and you can see that the vignette can be set to affect luminance and also focus so this one's if I just apply that and uh, we take a look at the effects the style of the the vignette here is blur if we say color then we can choose the vignette color here and the opacity of the color and then the softness of the the area and the aspect and the shape of the area and so on here or we can set it to color and blur so it's not only darken but also defocus at the edges it's a very quick and easy way to uh, to get um, vignette effects without having to draw shapes and uh, and mess with the the color corrector um, I'm not gonna have much time to go into detail on the, 
the library of tools within the, the BCC color and tone unit. There's a, a very broad palette of tools here, um, ranging from uh, basic color correctors, brightness and contrast, through to um, advanced color correction tools. I'm just going to touch, I'm to touch very briefly on um, a very useful tool here, which is the correct selected tool. And again, this gives um, editors and designers that are under time pressure a very quick way to, to do selective color grading. So if I go in here and sample the, the color of the vegetation here, um, we look at the, the mat here. There's my mat, and I can open up the key. And apply filters to the key, such as blur and so on. Choke, which will grow or shrink the mat area. So basically, I'm just after the, the vegetation here. So if we switch back to output. So now if I want to make the vegetation look a little bit more like uh, spring-like rather than um, parch, I can go in here and I can spin the hue around to get that looking a little bit more lush and green. We'll turn that off, bypass off and on to show before and after. And then if we want to protect other parts of the uh, the picture, if I just wanted to work with that tree, for example, and uh, not affect everything else, then we have the pixel chooser integrated with the, uh, the color corrector. So I want to go ahead and turn that on and say, I'll make a, a mask and choose from the preset shapes here. I'll set oval. And then if we look at the, uh, the mat, now we can see where the center of the oval is. We can pick that up and move it, put that in position. And now we're just affecting this area down here. If we switch back to output again, now I'm just changing the color of that particular tree. So it's very quick and easy um, and ideal for editors that are under under time pressure. As I said before, there's an inc you know, increasingly in, in the online session, uh, clients are making more and more demands of editors to actually roll up their sleeves and do some finesse color correction. And, and the final part of uh, today's session is going to be about driving uh, Avid Media Composer in the same way as you would an advanced color correction tool like Base Light or Resolve, um, and really layering up the grades and finessing and fine tuning the grade. Um, and the, the tool that makes that really um, that makes it possible within the within the Avid UI is the Pixel Chooser. So for the purposes of the rest of uh, the session, I'm going to be using Avid's native um, color corrector. Um, just to illustrate the point that um, that, that uh, the BCC Pixel Chooser isn't just for BCC tools; it can work with any any tool. So I'm going to take Avid's color correction and drop that onto my base layer, and I'm going to switch into color correction mode. And another uh, advantage of working with the native color corrector tool is that it presents the the editor or the colorist with a very familiar interface: the hue wheels. And the curves um, and many editors on Avid are, have been using these for years and uh, they're very intuitive for them. So we're going to use the native Avid tools but we're going to hold back the grades by using various uh, tools within BCC's Pixel Chooser. So on my base layer in video track one I'm going to keep my, my primary grade. So I'll go to my controls here and push the gamma a little bit just to bring the midtones out affect the blacks a little bit with setup notice in the waveform monitor white is showing me where I'm clipping so I don't want to go too too low with the, the blacks I don't want to lose too much detail and I'll just get the blacks where I want them somewhere like that and if I hit shift um, in Avid that will allow me to fine tune uh, my settings or I can dial those in manually as required. So now I've got my, my basic my basic grade. I'll bring my highlights down just a little bit because they're slightly clipped there. Now I've got my basic grade. I'm gonna just cool off the midtones a little bit. Just take some of that orange 
a very strong orange out of the, uh, the the church in the mid ground there, and you turn that off and on. That's I'm not, I'm not doing anything too extreme here. This is just my primary grade, and this is a good you know, kind of a good discipline really, is to keep your grades separate. So I'm going to keep my primary grade on this layer, and next up I want to affect the colour of the sky. So I'm going to give this a, its own dedicated layer. At the moment, I've got just a single segment in the timeline, but this may be uh, in the middle of a, um, uh, a timeline cont containing many shots before and after. So to add a, another layer above that, I'm going to use um, uh, a workflow that will very, very quickly allow me to just add a, a layer for this segment. So I'm going to go A to go to the start of the, uh, the shot. I'm going to I'm going to go into source record editing mode. I'm going to select that shot and I'm going to use the keyboard shortcut Control, Alt and A to, oh, sorry, Control, Alt and C. So it's Control, Control C for copy, but with, uh, with Alt or on, um, on Mac, it's Control, Option, C to copy the, the, the shot and also load it with its uh, handles into the source window. Now I'm going to go ahead and add another video track, that's Control and Y, or right click here and new video track. I'm going to enable that track for editing and I'm going to use the keyboard shortcut B to insert edit that. So if we had segments after and before, this workflow would enable me to just very quickly um, duplicate this segment and and leave all of the others unaffected. So now I've got a new layer containing the color corrector uh, and I can start to work with this in isolation. So in order to do that I'm going to go and grab from the key and blend unit I'm going to grab the pixel chooser and again I'm going to alt or option on Macintosh, drag that to my segment in order to add that above the layer below. So at the bottom layer, we've, on the bottom effect layer we've got the color corrector, next up we've got the, the pixel chooser. Um, another useful workflow if you're going to be working with a lot of effects is to rather than have to dig around in the browser, the effect browser for them, is to create a dedicated bin for your effect. So I'm going to go here and say, um, oop, I didn't want to hit the um, exit button, so if I just go back there. So if I now go and say new bin, which is what I actually meant to hit rather than exit, um, I'm going to use this bin to store my effects. So I'm going to take that color, that pixel chooser and I'm going to drag it into the bin. So that means that will be available for me to, to pick up next time. So let's twirl open the pixel chooser and take a look at the parameters. So why are we seeing a black and white image here? That's because the default output of the pixel chooser when used as a standalone tool is a black and white map. If we switch that to alpha channel, now we can see this video track composited over that video track. There's nothing to see here now because they're both the same. So I'm going to switch that back to its default a black and white map. And why are we seeing luminance? That is because the pixel chooser mat is pulled from the luminance channel. We take it from the red channel, that's the red. We take it from the blue, so we can see more sky now because there's more blue in the sky and so on. I actually want to pull the channel from the Kia. And the reason we're seeing a black and white mat here is because the default color for the European flesh tone pretty much matches the color of the church. So if we now switch back to output alpha channel, I'm going to sample the sky highlights and shadows and if we look at the uh, the black and white map now we can see a black and white map for the key of the sky once again we can adjust the softness in hue saturation and luminance to get the key the way we want it 
always a good idea to use softness to, to get your key as soft as you want it rather than resorting to using secondary post-processing tools like grow with choke or defocus unless you want to get a kind of a stylized look because um, if you don't get it um, as close as possible with the softness and, and get lazy and, and blur things then you're going to get um, edge artifacts when you especially when you do extreme correction so take care with the softness to get the to finesse the key and get it just uh, as close as you want before resorting to secondary tools so there's the alpha channel output so alpha means that this layer is being keyed over that layer uh, using that mat now I want to make the sky more saturated so if I 12 the pixel chooser closed you see that I added that above a color corrector if I now switch to color correction mode that's F2 with my keyboard shortcuts or this little button down here switch to color correction mode in the UI I can now select that color corrector and begin grading but before I do I just want to point out that I've actually skipped a very important step in the workflow and I've done it deliberately to show you what, what can go wrong so if I go into this color corrector and start grading I'm not getting the effect that I expected I'm affecting other colors apart from the sky um, and there's a good reason for that so I'm going to back up into the pixel chooser once again and take a look at a very important parameter so that parameter is the mat layer currently the mat layer is set to none which means that it's taking the output of this uh, group of effects on this layer and using them to feed the input of the key where I'm sampling I'm sampling the color of the sky so if I switch that uh, output back to black and white mat on the pixel chooser now go down to my color corrector and go into my controls for example saturation and start playing with the saturation and see how I, I'm messing up my key because I'm changing the saturation of the key input and the key is, the key is expecting a fairly saturated blue so obviously that's not going to work so if I go back up to the pixel chooser here again and do the right thing this time which is to select matte layer first below now my key input will be coming from the layer below which is not affected by the the color corrector which is applied to this layer very important step so if I go back to the color corrector now when pulling the key from the, the, the layer below and adjust my hue saturation whatever I can do whatever I like on this layer without breaking the key um, and now I'll go back to look at alpha channel and so I'll pump up the saturation a little bit and another thing to be aware of is if you don't have the right thing selected here then it will automatically create another color corrector let me just repeat that it's another another thing to watch out for in Avid so if I have my pixel chooser selected go into color correction mode and adjust something notice that it's added another color corrector above that and that's affecting everything less saturation more saturation for everything that's not what we want so with that selected I'll hit delete effect and now explicitly select the layer that I want to work with and now push the saturation or back off the saturation for the sky okay so there's a couple of little operational nuances there that are quite important in this workflow so if we bypass that we can see before and after we push the sky color I can get quite aggressive with that just so we can see what we're doing be respectful of the uh, the the instrumentation if I uh, go into the hue offsets and do something really mad then you can see that the uh, the waveform monitor is now, the, the the vector scope is now screaming it's saying you've you've gone way illegal here and if you submitted that for uh, broadcast in in Germany the, the engineers will probably throw the uh, the, uh, the file right back at you and say no we're not transmitting that um, so be respectful of the instrumentation and of course this is uh, in aesthetic terms a little bit extreme as well so let's just dial that back and get it a little bit more subtle so before 
and after I push the, the color of the sky. Next up, I want to do a little vignetting in the edges here. And we looked at uh, some strategies to do, for doing uh, quick and easy vignettes with uh, the Boris FX vignette tool. We can also do that with the, uh, we can also manually craft these with the, um, the color correction tools and the pixel chooser. So once again, I'm going to go control Y to add another video track. I'll select that track. Um, I'm going to drag another color corrector. Avid native color corrector into my composition. I might need that um, later on. So if I drag it to my bin, now I've got a, a color corrector with its unity values, its default values, just to quickly drag out of here without digging around in the uh, the, uh, the effects browser. So using your bins is uh, a, a really a really powerful way of um, organizing your effects. So I want to do a vignette here, so once again, I'll go to my bin where I've got my handy pixel chooser here and Alt or Option drag that into the composition above the, the layer that I want to work on. So if I go there, once again, we can see that it's in its default state keying off luminance. So I'm going to go ahead and turn the channel off. So now it's keying off nothing and I'm going to go and add an oval shape here. I'm going to soften the edges of that shape. So if we go into the, the mask group and hit feather to soften the edges, change the mask to scale to grow that out. And I want to affect the edges of the picture as with most solutions, white is a hole and black is a mask. So if we say invert mask, we can see the area where the um, the vignette's going to be working in the in the uh, the white part of the mat. So if we switch back to alpha channel and 12 pixel chooser closed, explicitly select that color corrector. Remember, um, important step. Explicitly select that, and now when we adjust our our levels, and these are applying only in the area which is not protected by the mat. So let's bring that up a little bit bigger. Uh, once again, we could consider it job done once we've um, uh, once we've uh, done a vignette. But one of w w one thing that I often notice um, when vignettes are applied is that they're applied in a rather obvious way. And for me, with my my colorist head on, that I, I do find obvious vignettes a little bit. A little bit troublesome, so I like to work with the shadow areas um, rather than the overall the overall picture. So if we go here and tweak that so that we can um, get the, the required result, then we should be able to see what we're going to get. So if we go here, so that's a little bit unsubtle to my eye. So I'm going to go back into my color corrector, dial that back just a little bit, and make that a little bit more subtle. But even so, I'm still slightly troubled by the fact that we've got a little bit of darkness up here when we should really only have darkness in the shadow. So if we go back into the pixel chooser and enable the Luma channel and invert the Luma channel, I'll just show you the mat so you can see where the uh, effect's working. So I'm going to invert the Luma channel now and say invert mat and now change the, the thresholds. So basically now what I'm doing is only affecting shadows within the vignetted area. Okay, so if we go back and uh, switch to alpha channel again, and I'll toggle that. I've actually gone quite extreme with this, this vignette just to indicate the difference that this this step would make. Okay, so if we go down into the color correct here and bypass off 
and on. We've got the ben benefit of the vignetting without giving the game away too much. It's not too obvious now to my eye. Yeah, we've got stronger shadows at the edges, but we haven't got uh, a very obvious vignette, which is um, a little bit more pleasing, I think. So, as I say, I've overcooked that slightly just to illustrate that. So I'm going to go into once again into my color corrector and select that and just pull that back a little bit. In fact, I'm going to reset that, Alt and click on any of these uh, any of these buttons here to re return the the value to Unity. Another level of subtlety that we can apply is if we go into the curves view in the color corrector. Curves will be very familiar to uh, to anyone working with any color, uh, any of the usual color correction solutions. Um, blacks are here, whites are here. If I mark a point at the midtones, so I'm not going to I'm not going to hit the midtones, and then another point just for the darkest shadows. Now I'm pulling the shadows down. I'll pull them up so you can see where I'm working. So now I'm only affecting the darkest shadows within a selection defined by the shadows. Okay, so that's another level of subtlety. Final step, I would like to bring this uh, this monument out here. So once again, I'm going to use the, uh, the mocha uh, the mocha roto shape to to isolate that. So once again, Control Y for a new video layer. Let's move that up where I want it. Alt and drag to move that up where I want it. And select the filler. Once again, add a color corrector. Alt or option, add a pixel chooser. And this time, I do want to key off the highlights. I want to adjust the white threshold and the black threshold so that I'm only picking up the bright white of the... Uh, the little monument here with the cross on it and because this is moving around I want to protect it. I'll add a little bit of blur to this because I want to kind of make it look glow glow a little bit and look kind of mystical and choke or expand the mat it's like grow and shrink in Photoshop and because it's moving around I need to track it with a mocha shape so I'll go in here and launch mocha don't worry about that because Mocha will pick up the uh, the detail as required, even at the the proxy resolution. And this time I'm going to create an X blind shape around the region of interest. Track that. And as before, I want to cut a hole in that shape. This little area here with the uh, the engraved uh, writing on, I want to protect that so that I don't blow it out. So I'm going to go back and say add an X-blind shape to cut a hole in my mat. I'll just show you the mat here. I'll show you it comped over grey. So that's my shape. I'll save that exit from Mocha, add a little bit of feathering to my shape and now we're just working within this region here. So if we change that back to alpha channel, 12 the pixel chooser closed and go back into the color corrector and go into color correction mode. And again, I'm going to use the curves. I want to protect the shadows now. I just want to push the brighter midtones and highlights within that area. And here, this illustrates again the importance of that step that I touched on about setting the uh, the correct matte input layer. Because I'm keying off, uh, I'm selecting from luminance. I'm increasing the luminance on this layer. Uh, and that's affecting the selection. So if I go back into the pixel chooser and say I want to affect uh, the, the uh, I, I don't want to affect this layer, I want to pull my map from the layer below. 
now when I go back to my color corrector and play around with the, the curves again, I'm only affecting the area in the key. It's a really important step to remember. So let's go to the effects mode to see that a little bit bigger. Turn on the effects here and, and toggle the curves off and on. You can see a kind of moody glow applied to that. Now I'm going to jump back down my composition, back to the vignette layer, back into my color corrector and play around a little bit with the, uh, the vignetting. Maybe make that a little bit more obvious. And now you can see that I've organized my, my grade in such a way that everything is in its own layer. Base grade, primary, sky color vignette, and let's put the effects mode on so we can see that a little bit bigger. Base grade, sky grade, vignette, and the little glow around the monument. And every, everything is sitting conveniently in its own layer. So maybe a, um, a little bit advanced for um, a one hour edit booking, but bear in mind that the online process is evolving. Editors are being called upon more and more to be colorists and to think like colorists and to organize their projects like colorists. And Boris, uh, Pixel Chooser is a really useful workflow tool in enabling you to build advanced grades, do advanced finishing such as the, uh, the beauty work we touched on earlier. Um, and uh, advanced grading with uh, with secondaries and tracking. So that kind of concludes uh, my my bit. I'm going to hand back to Mary now. And um, if you have any questions, then let me know. We had a uh, we had a lot of questions, but it seems like you answered most everything. Now, Dan, thank you so much for presenting. I think you did a wonderful job of demonstrating how the BCC 10 tools can combine with the Avid tools in a very interesting way. So we really appreciate your time. So thanks so much, guys, for tuning in. We really appreciate it. And you guys have a wonderful day.